Well, good afternoon and welcome to our sixth of six summertime meetups. And of course, we did the thing that we should always do and save the best for last. And we're excited that all of you are here this afternoon. Um, if you were here for previous uh, sessions, we're glad that you've come back. However, if this is your first Florida Consortium online meetup, a warm welcome and a, how did it take you so long to get here? Don't worry about it. We're going to have plenty of additional meetups coming in the following months, uh, hopefully in the fall, as we continue to work in this new normal. We're glad you're here as we wrap up the final session of our Florida Consortium online meetup series. My name is Michael Preston, and I'm the executive director of the Florida Consortium of Metropolitan Research Universities. For those of you who don't know us, Florida Consortium is a partnership between Florida International University, University of Central Florida, and the University of South Florida. In the past few weeks, we've been meeting online to discuss how to best support emergency remote instruction, student engagement, career readiness, and the realities of COVID-19 as it relates to higher education. I'd like to first thank the Helios Education Foundation for their continued support on our collaborative work, which includes this series. Throughout today's sessions, please post questions in the comments in the chat. I feel like I'm one of those teenagers that like, please subscribe and put in the chat. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately I'm 47 and aging quickly. Um, I'm excited about today's co-presenters. Um, Linnell Hodge, Dr. Linnell Hodge is a researcher and adjunct faculty at the University of Central Florida. Dr. Amanda Wilkerson is assistant professor at the University of Central Florida. And Emanuela, help me with that last name there. Stanislaus. <laughs> Stanislaus, there you go. I'm, I'm uh, I should have practiced, I it's admit. It's okay. <laughs> is a researcher and associate director at Florida International University, two of our member institutions, by the way. Their joint work on this topic appeared in the Metropolitan University's journal. Their findings underpin the power of multi-institutional collaboration and support services for students. And now I'll toss it over to the team for their formal introductions, and I will get out of your way. Thanks, take it away. Thank you, Preston, for that warm introduction. Um, I would like to say we're so happy to spend the next hour with you all, and we're excited to share our information with you. My name is Dr. Linnell Hodge, and as Preston mentioned, I'm an administrator at the University of Central Florida, and I, my research area is in secondary trauma. Today, we'll be focusing on research that we conducted on first-generation students and institutional websites and we would like to um, share those findings with you later on. But I'd like to pass it on to my research team collaborator, Dr. Wilkerson. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Wilkerson. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Central Florida in the College of Community Innovation and Education. And much of my research looks at how we can engage communities of color uh, to support student success. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Emanuela Stanislaus. I am from Florida International University, where I serve as an associate director within our Career and Talent Development Office, and I'm um, excited to have everyone here today. So we will be spending the next hour with you, and we want to make sure that we spend this time appropriately because we know that everyone is busy and they you all have a lot to work on. So we wanna first thank you for spending this time with us and hopefully we can engage you in a, in a vigorous conversation. So, so what to expect today is that the presentation is broken up into two different um, sections. First, we'll, we'll share our research with you um, from the Kumu article or the um, MEJ article, and then we'll transition into how we're expanding the research especially with the undertones of the impacts of COVID-19. So first, we'll share our research. We'll move to expanding how we're, um, we've expanded that research, which will be featured in a Paul Graph book chapter later on in 2021. And then we'll also be focusing on COVID-19. Now, because the majority of us are practitioners, we want to make sure that we spend some time in engaging with you on some discussion. What's the point of coming to a professional development if only if the pres presenters are talking to you? And I know as much as you do that 
when we when we get into the room, we definitely have a lot to say. So we want to make sure that we have um, time to engage you in discussion. We'll be focusing on some barriers that we identified through our research, and we're going to also share with you the critical care approach, which we find to be a very effective way um, approach to engaging first generation students and also any other vulnerable population that you've identified. Then we'll move on to the implications from our research, but also how the impact of COVID has moved the field of higher education. We'll of course share some recommendations and then we'll wrap up with a call to action. And of course, during that time, we'll have uh, questions and answers. So before we get started, I want to get our juices flowing and start thinking about the, the conversation today. So we just launched a, a poll question. Um, you should be on your screen right now. Um, and if it isn't, it's coming in two, two seconds. But we ask that um, for everyone on the call to just go ahead and, and chime in. Um, and the question is, does your department or college website communicate support services for vulnerable students? And Linnell, um, maybe you might um, just share with the audience um, what, you, what you guys mean by vulnerable students. I was muted. There Number one rule, check if you're unmuted. Thank you, Latoya. Yes, for uh, our discussion, we're gonna primarily focus on first generation students because that's the area of um, research that we focus on, this, that population. But in terms of vul vulnerable student populations, what we want you to think about is what does that look like and translate into your campus? So that could be students of color or minority students, affinity groups, it could be your LGBTQ plus population. It could be your low socioeconomic students, your DACA students, or any student group that you have prioritized that's high risk, at risk, or vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and the responses are coming in um, ever so, uh, well, not slowly, but, but briskly it's coming in. We are about 82% of attendees have voted, and I'll just give it another second or so um, to give folks uh, their uh, one more minute to to join in and give their their thoughts. Uh, right. Great. Thank you. We're approaching 90%. Um, and then um, you, the, the results will, will pop up. All right, um, I'll kick it back to you, but, uh, uh, but if you're not seeing uh, for some reason um, the responses, 60% of people um, say that their websites, uh, uh, that yes, they're, their websites commun communicate support services, 12% say no, and 29% um, are not sure. I'll hand it back to you, Linnell. Great, thank you again for taking the poll and sharing your information with us. Um, we would like to um, share with you that based on the research, um, this polling is very high in terms of thinking that your the information that's hosted on your website is effectively efficiently communicating to students. So what I would recommend or suggest is that if you are th one of the institutions that indicated that your website is communicating appropriately to your student population, I wonder if you can comfortably answer what are the metrics saying in terms of touch points, where are your students going to look for information? How often are there key search functions, uh, keyword functions that they're using to actually get to your website? Because I think a lot of times when we think about our website, it's a holding space. But this conversation that we are having with you today is 
this is an engagement tool. So if the information is on your website, when's the last time you updated that information? Does it reflect the current, in most cases, remote environment? So if, if we were to ask you that follow-up question, would your answer change? And in, in based on the literature, that might be yes. For some schools, maybe not, because you've had the time to really investigate how you can use uh, your website as a tool. Latoya, are you going to use the second um, question? Uh, would you like me to go ahead and launch the second question right now? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> It should be lo loading very, very in a minute or two. And um, as it's loading, the question is, now that colleges and universities have shifted to remote instruction slash learning advising, has this website been revised and updated? So it links back to Linnell's question um, just a moment ago. Um, and the responses are coming in ever so briskly. We're about at 47% right now. Um, and so we'll just give folks a, a little bit more time to just to chime in because this is really important to today's conversation. We're at about 67%, so we'll just wait to a few mom moments and then we'll close, close it up. But please feel free to chime in um, to the poll. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and close the poll and um, we landed at um, at 62% said yes, 14% said no, and about 24% said not sure. Mm. Okay. So these numbers um, didn't shift quite a bit. So what I would recommend is for the schools that are not sure, the institutions that are not sure, to really engage with us throughout the uh, uh, meetup, but also would start thinking about what is it that can be done to make you a little bit more sure. So that could look like um, engaging some of your student assistants or student populations to review and provide feedback on your website. For the institutions that indicated yes, we would love to be able to hear what what resources and um, what systems that you have in place to make your website such a dynamic tool. So we'll leave that, um, that uh, point of discussion towards the end, but thank you for everyone that participated in the poll. So now that we've gotten you the juices flowing and um, giving you a sense of what to expect, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, um, Emanuela, to discuss um, more. Oh, not yet. Before we do that, um, let me talk to you a little bit about the study. Uh, we conducted a six-month study on 14 Kumu institutions, and we specifically looked at websites as a dynamic communication tool. Our population were first-generation students. And the reason why we used first-generation students is because for years, decades, we've, we've tried to engage and understand the behaviors of first-generation students. They are still a large population that are entering the academy. And in some cases, um, we have still um, not been able to really pin down how to best serve them. So what we, can, what we did in order to facilitate this research is that we conducted, a, of course, literature review to better understand first-generation gener students currently. And then we applied the question, how are they navigating institution websites? Now, I want to clarify this, the websites that we looked at range from state colleges to public and private institutions, but they were all metropolitan universities as identified by Kumu. Uh, and the reason why it was important to select that type of institution was because literature suggests that 
first generation students um, more than likely often select metropolitan institutions to attend. So what did, what did we find out? What did we learn? For some of you, this might be a refresher. We learned that this generation of students are online a lot more. They're savvy. And in some cases, they are interacting with our websites more so than the human, which would mean staff and faculty. So with that piece of information, we wanted to understand, well, how would they navigate a web site to one, identify the services that they need and, and how are they forming those questions? So we created a rubric to assess the um, institution websites and you can find the full um, study results in the chat. I believe there's a link to that. So if you're wanting to know, um, all of the information that is from that study, you'll have access to it. It's publicly um, listed. So what we found out is first-generation support services are not standard across institutions, which presented a, a pretty interesting dynamic. So we are saying that we are reaching out to these students and we're identifying them as a vulnerable population, but often, if a student is selecting between two institutions and the information is not similar, how can they make a holistic decision about attending a school? Now, we're not suggesting that information needs to be standard across the board because what we found is schools, institutions who presented to the information seamlessly, they were able to engage students with how to connect to services. So again, we're not suggesting that first generation support services need to be standardized, but what we are suggesting is that we take the time to understand how, uh, how are those gaps in information, especially when the, when the student hasn't made a final decision about institutions. So with that said, we really looked and saw that the information was fragmented. It was not always centrally located and the student had to click on institution websites quite a bit in order to find the information. So not only did they have to do a bit of research, they also needed to know the keywords in order to input to get the information. So that's a missed opportunity because we are sometimes communicating information in higher education jargon and the student does not use that same language. So it's a missed opportunity to really engage and connect the student to the information. So it's really, really important that when you're taking a look at your website, you're looking at keywords and are those words what you what the student would use? And if not, then that is a missed opportunity to really engage the student. Now, we submitted the, the research pre-COVID and we were really feeling great about what we found. And we have an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to extend the study. So what we're doing is taking a look again and then applying COVID on top of that as a, uh, uh, another problem statement. And now really critically looking at if there were gaps in information pre-COVID, what does that do post-COVID? And I say post-COVID in jest, because we're still trying to navigate a very unknown system. And so our hope today is that we can preview a little bit of what will be published later on. Now I will pass it on to my colleague, Emanuela, to continue on. Great, thank you, Dr. Hodge. And so, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about how things have changed in higher education. So. As Dr. Hodge shared, we conducted this this um, this research um, last year. Uh, we started this project around this time, and so so many things have changed in higher education, and it's changed in ways that we would have never imagined, right? And so um, when we look at higher ed now, we're seeing how we have swiftly moved operations to a virtual space, and in a matter of days and um you know it's unheard of and we we all did this in an effort to um stop the, the spread 
of COVID-19. And so with these, it prevents, or, or presents some unique challenges in higher education. Um, some of them may be in the instance of how do we support our vulnerable students when in-person interactions are limited? Also, how do we move uh, to remote, remote support services so that these students are feeling supported when in-person interactions are very limited? Um, additionally, what existing communications do we have for first-gen and vulnerable students that need to be analyzed or, or overhauled completely? Um, so those are the things that we're, we're kind of asking ourselves on top of other things, of course, but then on top of the COVID, we have other things that are uh, impacting uh, higher ed as well. When we think about social justice concerns that are um, arising uh, via the Black Lives Matter movement, um, police brutality, and our students are bringing up concerns where they, where they don't feel like they're supported on our campuses. And so that's bringing up the, the other piece about allyship. And what role does um, higher ed professionals uh, play in um, providing allyship to our underrepresented um, student populations and also as a way to tackle the issues and inequities that exist within higher education? So that leads us to, to talk about where we're taking the study um, moving forward. So as Saha shared, we are in the process of uh, getting a chapter um, uh, published in a, in a book uh, next year. And so one of the things that we're doing is we are looking at how we can incorporate a critical care model to see how institutions are communicating their services to vulnerable students. And this is a framework that um, we think specifically will work to support uh, what we're doing to support our, our vulnerable students. And in our personal experience, we have seen that departments within higher education have created websites, have uh, adjusted the contents of these websites, but have done so without communication um, with students and those populations that we're really hoping for that um, information to serve. And so within this, this model, the thing that is a, a piece is that we're centering the care for individuals. Many of us have joined, um, have gone into education fields because we care for students, right? And so what's What's at stake here is how do we define cared about? And research has found that even though uh, you care as an individual or educator within education, um, stereotypes still exist. And when these stereotypes exist, the culture that it creates is that we want to save the student instead of actively challenging the higher education institutions to um, challenge the, oppression, the oppressive structures that exist. So that's what this is um, talking about. So critical care comes from the medical field, um, as well as has some ties to um, psychology, as well as early um, education. Um, and we think that it would work well with what we're talking about because of the history of higher ed and borrowing from other helping fields to, to create and innovate, um, innovate the ways that we connect with our students. And so within this model, like I said, the care for, which is the student, is at the center of everything that is done. Um, the idea is to not project what the cared for population needs, but to actually seek that information from them. And so that's the piece that I think that we may be lacking um, is asking those students, what is it that they need, right? And then also asking ourselves, how do we serve, how do we serve student success? And how is the information that we portray on our website tying into that or, or um, speaking that, that uh, information to students? 
So um, want to make sure that we do um, say that. The other piece of the care, um, critical care model is a focus on social justice. And so within that, um, the uh, individuals or the researchers that are, are in this field looking at critical care, they're saying that educators are not only educating, but they're also calling out um, the inequities that exist. Camille Cooper, um, who's a researcher um, in this area, uh, looked at pushing the envelope of the critical care model to see how, um, what we can learn from the parenting styles of African-American women. And she states that the lessons offered from African-American women's uh, care and traditions indicate the importance of raising consciousness about the complexities, context, and power dynamics affecting how care is felt, received, and expressed among cultural diverse groups. What we are thinking in terms of that is how are we advocating for our students? What role do we play um, in making sure that these vulnerable students get the information that they need, even when they don't know that they need it, right? Before they need it, how are we, how are we doing that? And it's in, incumbent upon um, university officials to ensure that necessary information is shared with students. Um, also, Tamara Bubal-Lafentant, she shares how caring mirrors mothering and that teachers nurture, yet, yet at the same time, they're resisting structures at the place. Um, she discusses how knowledge is provided as a source of power. And so through the web, the information that we share on our website, there is a shift of power that we're trying to engage in so that these students um, can succeed, right? And so uh, educators within that, they are aware of the inequities that exist and then they're fighting um, for them through uh, social justice and through the work. And what we're saying is it's, we're engaging in that through the work that we're doing through the information that, our, um, that we're supplying through our process. Now that I've gone through uh, the model, I want to share some considerations for, for us uh, moving forward. One of those um, pieces is that it's necessary for us to have culturally competent staff. What do we mean by that? Uh, what we are suggesting is that we need to make sure that staff are trained to work with students from a diverse um, set of backgrounds. Dr. Mush talked about, you know, we're talking about first-gen students, we're talking about monetized, um, uh, minoritized student populations, LGBTQ um, plus, as well as um, student with disabilities and a whole host of other um, backgrounds. But then we can have a student that is all of those things, um, where all of those uh, backgrounds are intersecting. And so how um, confident are we um, in the information um, that our staff has to support those students um, and to not uh, other those students and to, to make them uh, feel uh, supported in our environments? The other piece to that is dismantling oppressive systems. And that can only happen through educating our, our staff. And so uh, making sure that staff has the necessary um, information to understand the historical context of uh, where higher ed uh, was constructed and where we are today and what oppressive um, systems are in place that um, they would need to um, therefore um, interrogate. And then lastly, um, we need to create and promote environments that foster learning um, for diverse backgrounds. And then within that, we want to make sure that we're promoting um, the ability for our team members to challenge inequities that exist, not just our staff, but also students as well. How do we respond when students challenge these, these kinds of things and creating a, a an environment where that is allowed so that we can um, engage in the social justice work that needs to be done. 
And so now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Amanda Wilkerson, who will talk through some of the recommendations as well as um, implications that we have for you. Thank you, Emanuela. Um, good afternoon again. Uh, today I'll be presenting uh, the implications and recommendations of this study. As you know, the premise for modern day post-secondary education institutions, among other things, is that we ensure that learners um, have the potential to use the variety of resources that is available to them in order to assist in their matriculation towards credit, uh, excuse me, degree credential. Um, so in our work, we micro-targeted our focus to look at a specific population, um, vulnerable populations, and a specific resource, the university website. So based upon our findings, our implications are really framed around three specific areas, practice, policy, and research considerations. Traditionally, university websites have been very branded, and I believe that the authors of this research um, stand by that contention. Yet, our research provides an opportunity for additional catalytic action, if you will. The goal of practitioners is to think through how websites and website information can inform and appeal to those first generation vulnerable student populations? In what ways do we need to reframe the website information to provide information that they're going to click on and know that the information is speaking to them? And then how do we evaluate our websites um, annually, which is grounded in this notion of how to best serve students? And I would just add, how do we help students within the current context of the era we're in, decentralized learning, COVID-19. Um, and I'll speak more to that as I uh, present recommendations. Um, another implication for this study is connected with policy. To be clear, while we are hopeful that policy beyond uh, the organization of educational institutions can provide guidance, we really believe that organizational policy plays a critical role in strengthening practices. As such, it's necessary for post-secondary settings to consider how policy can inform practice of professionals and improve the usage for students. So for example, creating incentives for students to engage online, strengthening the promotion of websites and its services and recognizing the collection of knowledge and information that is available on the website and how it can be used to fidelity. And finally, our last implication is research. At the conclusion of this study and really after radically uh, examining the importance of the study, we acknowledge that more research must be conducted to account for the variances that we found among the institutions who got it right with their websites and those that might need to address some of their practices with the websites. In light of these revelations, it is necessary to maybe conceptualize new research questions around this work that will re reveal additional information regarding what we can do to support vulnerable student populations through websites. Excuse me. So one of the things we can do is determine, excuse me, one of the questions we can ask is determine how the online enterprise of disseminating resources for vulnerable student populations can be relevant and understood by the students um, and extend research on the new click and connect functions of post-secondary websites. Now, with regard to our uh, recommendations, um, I, I want to quote Thomas Paine. I think that his work in the crisis is completely appropriate for what we're dealing with now. One of the quotes that I love the most is when he says, these are the times that try men's souls. And I think we all can agree that we're certainly in trying times. COVID-19 uh, deepened inequities uh, that existed in higher education and really emphasized for student personnel, professionals, um, faculty members, administrators, and everyone that works within the institution, our need to confidently 
and boldly act on behalf of the learners that come to our institution. So while I have a list, this is by no means um, radical. It's mostly expansive enough to help us think through our own processes. And I would hope that you would um, take a look at this list and see how you can, where does this fit in within the work that you're doing? So COVID-19, pre-COVID-19 recommendations is to use student personnel services and technology to foster information design. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes, how are we working together outside of our silos to really pull on the skills and the talents of people that are within the university to help us with this work? That may mean that when you're developing the website, you're pulling on institutional knowledge as well as your department and other areas, maybe graphic and communications to uh, build a website that is providing messaging so that students can really click in to the information. Another consideration or recommendation is focus exclusively on achievement, um, meaning what information are you providing that will help students uh, be successful as they're moving along the spectrum of completing their coursework? Also, in thinking about achievement, one of the things that we believe is very important is that we do benchmarking either with peer or aspirational institutions to see what other practitioners are doing to communicate messages um, that will support students who are part of this vulnerable population. I would add that we also adapt or adopt an asset-based messaging. Instead of looking at the vulnerabilities of this population, we need to understand those vulnerabilities, but act and provide information that speaks to their possibilities. This is important. And then to hold everyone accountable. Now, I imagine that many of you that participated in the poll um, might be saying that you're doing one or a number of these recommendations. And for that, I applaud you. But I think after COVID-19, we have to really consider that our practices in many ways have to change. And so what I would like to recommend, or what we would like to recommend is ongoing capacity building. Within higher education, we do things in committees. Uh, we set um, um, deadlines according to a 30, 60, 90 day, possibly even a year. And what we have to do is look at this information and more rapidly assess how we can help. That may change our format for how we're doing it. So looking at how we're building the capacity to share information that's useful for students and then focus on the whole student. Now I mentioned this or we mentioned this uh, in relation to a work we have been reading about what it's like for students to do um, remote online learning at home. One story stuck out to me in particular was of a student who had not come out to his parents and he's a part of the LGBTQ community and what it was like to still be a part of that community, but not um, being in an environment where it was safe to talk about it. So we're going to have to consider how do we um, support students with information online when they're not in an environment where we can touch them. And then we need to develop a model to assess and change the websites and promote messaging that stimulates and supports student success. These are our recommendations for the study that we conducted and recommendations that we're providing in light of COVID-19. And we know that more work is going to be done on this, but we appreciate that you've given us an opportunity to discuss this. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to my colleague, Dr. Hodge, to provide us with additional information. Thank you both um, for sharing the information for our participants today. So how would I summarize what we've talked about? Well, what we're saying is that if your website is a space for information and information only, we are asking you to radically think about how can your website engage students? So there's a loop. If they're not able to connect to a human, how can your websites fill that gap? It is not enough that it is just a placeholder for information. We need to borrow from other industries where their websites are used dynamically. So if we're gonna say that we wanna reach students, 
and we're using websites as a mode, it cannot be an afterthought. It needs to be integrated in the way we work with students. There's a social contract that we've all signed, and that is we're gonna help students along. And in, in some cases, we're making decisions for them, but we're challenging you to say, what information do we think students need, but also engage them in sharing that information as well. So what we've provided is a supplemental handout that's available um, for download. And we there are a couple of things that are situated in the handout. One, we're asking you to commit and recommit to our to our students. And I say our because they're all of our responsibilities. We want to address the student holistically, which means their social, emotional, and academic success. We don't get students in pieces. We get the whole student. And what does that mean? It means that we have to commit and recommit to being honest about the gaps that we have and how can we fill those gaps, especially during a time that we are remote for some cases. We want to humanize our processes as much as possible, but also use the resources that we have available to make sure that students can connect regardless of the time. In addition to that, we want you to ask, answer some tough questions, right? Who are your change agents? Are you overworking them? Because the students have communicated in their back channels that Ms. Emanuela is the person to go to and she'll help me with everything. We want you to think about how are you supporting those employees who are connecting students? And especially now, knowing that we might not be able to see them face to face, we might not be able to pick up on body language. How can we engage them with a tool that we know they're using? We, there's a, a tool that they are engaging in pretty frequently. So we want you to answer some of those tough questions in the, in the comfort of your offices, but what we want you to do is be radically honest. How can you do more when we're already overextended? How can you reach students sooner, faster, consistently as much as possible? We've also provided a quick reading list, as we know now that in addition to COVID, we're also in an era of a lot of civil rights issues, whether it's police brutality, Black Lives Matter, appropriate allyship. We want you to dust off the, the, those uh, books that you might have on your bookshelf and engage in the, the current contemporary um, experts and scholars that are sharing information about how are we engaging as a community. Now, the recommended list, some are very focused on higher education, while others are providing um, information about the human experience. So we would advocate, check out the list, but make sure that you are creating additional reading for your staff to be able to engage in contemporary issues with contemporary solutions. And that when you're doing that, you're also making sure that students know that you are there to help. And with that, we would like to conclude our presentation, this meetup, and then open it up for questions in the chat. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And this is uh, some great information. And, and this seems to go as part of our theme between our three our last three um, sessions, one was about bots and the other about websites and, you know, certainly how um, we can communicate with students from a distance in, in a much different um, world. <clears throat> how, I guess, as I was listening to this, we're creating much more of a dynamic conversation with our students now, um, and especially uh, areas, um, places like social media are a place where our students seem to be finding um community and they're finding ways that they're going to communicate with each other either uh accurately or sometimes inaccurately uh i you know i think we found um there's a lot of inaccuracies especially when it comes to opening back up the universities to you know in light of COVID 19 
um, or even, um, you know, recently a, a, a faculty member at the University of Central Florida who um, certainly has a dubious past and has uh, identified himself as somebody that is concerning to our students. How does this process learn from that conversation out on social media and adjust itself in real time in a way that reflects the conversation, but also is is accurate in its reporting? I, I hope I'm making myself clear, but it's it, it seems to be a feedback loop that we need to explore. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's a multi-layered question will, and will require multi-layer response. So one thing I think we um, have to do is make sure that we are paying attention to social media. Let's be honest, Facebook is not where our students are. YouTube, TikTok, um, in some cases, Snapchat. That's where they're posting and living out their lives. So we need to be able to uh, make sure that they know that that space is safe to share those thoughts, but also know that we can engage them privately and then um, engage the system publicly. And what I mean by that is, Students are sharing on social media that they're having a problem with this particular faculty member. Publicly, what we need to do is engage the system that allowed the faculty member to continue to thrive in this environment because the information isn't new. What happened, social media pushed the information faster and more globally. So what we need to do is engage the students who share their information publicly. We need to contact them privately, but while we're doing that and supporting them and connecting them to resources, is to also make sure that publicly we're addressing the systems that created these um, environments. And let's be clear, Dr. Oh, I can't remember his name. And we don't want to center the conversation on him. What we want to center the conversation is how he, has he created barriers for student learning, for student safety, whether it's emotionally or personal safety, right? Because we have to manage both of those things as administrators, as educators, as practitioners. What we need to do is understand why the system didn't allow to believe the students. And it is not enough to rely on policies that protect staff, right? Because students are actively engaging and sharing their concerns. So we need to be able to look at how the system failed the students and rapidly um, and quickly, rapidly, um, sustainably address those concerns, but do it publicly. I think what we don't often talk about in higher education is that we have a social contract with students. And a part of that is trusting that they will be safe on our campuses. And once that trust is gone, we have to actively work to make sure that we correct it. And we have to publicly apologize and systematically fix and refix, right? And so sometimes we break that trust by not fully speaking with them about taking out the student loan debt. Or what does it even mean to come on our campus? In some cases is racism, sexism, misogyny on our campuses. We need to be able to be honest to say, hey, we need to do some work here. And we want to fold you in as much as possible without burdening you with the emotional labor, labor to fix it. Hopefully that answered your question. 